Yay. Hello, my name is Ron Watkins, and I'm a shark ambassador for Sharks for Kids. And for those of you not familiar with Sharks for Kids, uh, we are a group of volunteers dedicated to creating the next generation of shark advocates. And we do that through webinars like we're going to be doing today, as well as in-person class sessions where we teach you all about sharks and the important roles that they play in the oceans and on our planets. So today we've got a, another special guest on, and if you've seen any of the previous drawing sessions, you've probably met Julius. Um, Dr. Julius is a, a professional artist, um, and I'll let him give a full introduction. Um, but one of the things that I think is so cool is when I go to mail something to uh, in the post office, I get to put a stamp on of a dinosaur and it's actually a dinosaur three-dimensional that Julius has drawn. So he's uh, very well accomplished. Um, so thanks for joining us again. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. It's, it's always a pleasure to be a part of this right. webinar. And uh, today we're going to be drawing a very, very special shark and it's the cookie cutter shark. And to celebrate that, I dressed up as a cookie cutter shark. So I have my cookie cutters and I'm obviously a shark. So that's the best I could do for a cookie cutter shark today. I think that's awesome. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll hopefully that'll inspire me to draw better the cookie cutter shark. And you'll take a good bite out of the fun here. So. <laughs> oh man, the shark jokes are already. Uh oh, here we go. <laughs> Thanks. Some of the, the folks like the costume. Excellent. Um, <laughs> so let me go ahead and start off. I've got a few slides just to introduce. Um, you know, this is sort of a special drawing section because it's the week of Halloween. And I know we've done this in the past and we always like to have fun with sharks and, and Halloween. So let me share my screen again. And I will show you a little bit about, are you seeing uh, your slide there? Yep. Okay, excellent. So as I mentioned today, we are gonna learn how to, um, to draw this really cute cookie cutter shark. Um, it looks a little scary. Um, it's got some teeth and we're gonna talk about how it uses those teeth and how it got its name, the cookie cutter. It's not because it wears cookie cutters around its neck, <laughs> me. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully you're out there getting ready for Halloween, maybe carving pumpkins and just wanted to put up some of the pumpkin shark themed ones that I found out there that might give you some inspiration. The one in the bottom left is actually one that I carved uh, with a shark coming out. Uh, there's many templates online you can find. You've got your baby sharks and your Jaws theme. So you know, be creative and, and have fun with your pumpkin carving if you do that. Um, next, let's talk a little bit about the treats. These are the treats I give out. So when the kids come to my door, they've got to reach in the shark mouth and uh, get, get a nice <laughs> treat out of there. And uh, there's different types of shark treats that they can have. And then we've even had some kids that have had little bags that are shark themed bags. So Halloween's always fun. And I always give extra candy if you've got a Jossum Shark <laughs> costume like one of these. So I'm always, uh, the kids in my neighborhood know that when they come to my door, you know, they better be prepared to uh, sing Baby Shark for candy. Or if they have a shark <laughs> costume, they get even more candy. So uh, this is a shark that I photographed, a kid <laughs> shark. I photographed this one underwater once after Halloween. So that's always fun. So sometimes keep those costumes on. And maybe you've got a pet you want to get involved in the sharky costume. So these are some different uh, costumes. I have a French bulldog, so I might <laughs> dress him up like that this year. And even cats can get involved. So these are my friend's cats, um, you know, scaredy cats. And there are different types of hammerhead cat sharks and uh, great white cat sharks. So lots of ideas. You got cat so, sharks and bull. And isn't that cute. great? Hope, hopefully, you, <laughs> do you get trick or treaters up where you're at? Uh, uh, yes, we do. We do. Uh, our street doesn't have many of them, uh, unfortunately, but but there are in the neighborhood here. We do have a lot. So yeah, it's a lot of fun that way. Right. 
So um, if you haven't heard of or seen or read the Shark Superpowers book by our founder, uh, Jillian Morris, and her husband, Duncan, uh, highly, highly recommend it. But I uh, wanted you know, to show you a couple sharks in there because um, one of them is the goblin shark, and that's sort of a scary sounding shark and, and one that we actually drew last Halloween. That was a lot of fun, uh, Julius. And so you can learn about the goblin shark and what makes it so unique looking. And this is what we drew uh, last year uh, was this uh, scary looking goblin <laughs> shark. And Julius did an excellent job of showing everyone how to do that. Um, but today we're going to draw the cookie cutter shark. And at first appearance, you might think, oh, he doesn't look that scary. But when you learn some more facts about him, if you're a whale, a dolphin, a tuna, you might be a little scared of this particular shark. And we'll learn a little bit more about this, this small shark. It's not real big. It's usually about a, a foot or so, um, but it's got quite a bite. Um, so some of you may have uh, heard a shark talk we did earlier with Jeff Millison. And he was talking about Hawaii sharks and he goes on a lot of black water dives. So he goes out in thousands of feet of water. Uh, he only goes down about, you know, 50, 60 feet, but you get all kinds of things coming out at night. And one of them are cookie cutter sharks. And these are some actual pictures wow. that he took of cookie cutter sharks. And these are very, very rare sharks. Yeah. And wow. Jeff is one of the few people in the world that actually has seen and taken these pictures of cookie cutter sharks. And that's because they're ambush predators. So they come out, they vertically migrate from the bottom depths and they'll look for their prey. So what do these guys like to eat? Well, mm -hmm. the reason they're called cookie cutters is because those teeth have a way of cookie cuttering out a chunk of a fish. So this is a big uh, tuna that you can see that circular hole and it was actually precisely, it looks like it was almost surgically removed, but the cookie cutter can use its teeth and spin and twist and pull out just a nice little bite size. So that's how he gets the cookie cutter because anytime you see these types of markings on a, on a whale, a dolphin, even another shark, it's, it's a cookie cutter. And a cookie cutter is a type of uh, dogfish, and we'll learn more and talk more about different facts as we go through it, but it spends most of its time in the deep and you never see it. Um, and that's why there's not a lot of photos of them. Uh, the, you know, there's more photos of, I think, these sharks uh, dead that have washed up or floating along. But look at these teeth and just imagine as it opens its mouth and can put it on that big tuna and cut out a nice little cookie sized uh, bite for it to feed on. So that's what makes it scary, not obviously for uh, humans, but if you're an uh, unsuspecting tuna, um, you might be a little scared of these sharks. So Julius has, has created a coloring sheet that's on our website. Um, this is an example of that. So you can download this for free and color these cookie sharks. And today we're gonna actually draw these cookie sharks. So with that, Julius, I, I uh, thought I would turn things over to you and we'd get started with the drawing exercise and I'm gonna get my paper and pencil ready as well. So let me stop sharing. Okay. And I'll let you share. Right on. And Thank uh, you, for those of you uh, that's joining, they're joining us today or watching this video, go ahead and get your paper uh, and pencil. Usually, you know, you could have a couple colored pencils as well. So I'm going to get those. Sounds good. I'll start up my screen in the meantime. Right on. That was a really great introduction, Ron. Um, really nice uh, stuff about the cookie cutter shark. Uh, well, maybe someday I'll have pictures that I've taken of them, but for oh, now, I hope I'm so. Vicariously through Jeff's pictures. Yeah, okay, those were I see your screen there. Okay, great. Yeah, I love Jeff's pictures. Those were really impressive. Um, yeah, totally a rare species to be able to see, just because they are such deep water sharks normally, and yes. it, and it's just because of their ability to come up at night, do this. This is what's called a DL migration. 
uh, coming up to the surface or near the surface at night that we actually even can can see them if we're not in a, a deep water submersible. Um, yeah, really, really cool to be able to to take photos of this this beautiful little shark, only about as long as your forearm, a uh, little yeah. tiny thing. So as sharks go, uh, but they have uh, statistically the largest teeth relative to their body size for any living shark species. Uh, so it, it, they, they do have quite a superpower there, as you were saying. So here we go. This is the kind of what we're going to be after today. This is the preview of the sketch we're going to be doing. And uh, so we're going to, you can see from the, from the shape and from comparing it to uh, Jeff uh, Millison's photos that Ron had just shared that this looks a little bit more like it's coming a little bit more at you because uh, the front end is a little bit larger. Just keep in mind that Overall, it's kind of shaped like a torpedo, um, very smooth, uh, almost uniform thickness all the way from the front to the back, except where the tail kind of narrows. But here, I like to draw things where they're kind of a little bit more interesting than just a side view. So it's kind of uh, like we're imagining we're, we're let's say, one of the, the, the prey species, let's say a whale or a, or a tuna or another large shark, for example, or a seal, and, and we're seeing it as it's coming toward us. Uh, and these are, as Ron mentioned, uh, ambush predators. They will sneak up and um, they'd have to because other animals, you know, they, I guess they don't like getting bitten, even though it's just oh, no. a single bite they take out. They don't go to kill an animal. They go to just take a bite out. But, you know, I guess it's still uncomfortable. So they, they'd want to avoid it. Um, but they, this is the one species or sorry, there are actually two recognized species of it. Two recognized species of sharks that are termed ectoparasites. They're not uh, typical predators in the sense of an animal that feeds on another animal by killing it. These are ectoparasites, which means that they, ecto meaning outside and parasite meaning a way of life where they take resources, um, in this case meat, from another animal without necessarily killing it. And it's, it's such an unusual thing for a shark. It's really interesting. Okay, so what I've set up here is a page. Uh, I'm doing this digitally, so I've got my tablet and my stylus. But if you want to, you can do it with a regular sheet of paper. Ron's got one coming up there. Um, but I've set this up in an eight and a half by 11 inch page format. So if you have a letter sized page, this will be easy to do. And uh, the idea here is to make this so that everybody can follow along. So I've uh, made this. I've organized it so that we can do it by making some guide shapes first, and then we'll draw in the, with heavier lines the final details over the top of that. So uh, keep a uh, thing to keep in mind here is I am going to be drawing the guide shapes in red. You don't have to. If you have two colors, that's great. Then you know use a lighter color for the guide shapes, and you'll tell you'll be able to tell when I'm using red versus black. And for the black, when I use that, it means that we should be making heavier lines. Uh, for the final details. The reason why we want to go lightly with the guide shapes is because some of it we might want to erase out little bits of the lines just to make it look better afterwards. But it helps us to draw certain shapes first. Okay. So when you're doing that and you see red, draw lightly. Uh, if you see black, then you know draw heavily. Okay. So let's get started then. How about I'm going to uh, remove the well actually uh, one more thing before before I get started with the drawing. So you can use these to color them as well afterwards, if you like. And here's a, uh, a version that uh, from the, the poster before of a oh, colored cool. in version. And so you can see that it has this neat little color, dark color around its uh, head. And we'll talk more about that as we go. But that's just to keep in mind, that's a neat uh, um, adaptation that looks like from the best of our knowledge, has to do with luring prey toward it, which is an interesting bit. Uh, and there's the green eyes. The green um, is caused by a layer on the inside of the eye, behind the back of the eye, called the tapetum lucidum. And other animals, like cats, have this as well. If you shine a flashlight in the dark at night and you see the cat eyes glowing and um, uh, reflecting that light, well, that's their tapetum lucidum. It's a very reflective layer behind the eye. And the reason for it is that when the light enters the eye, it hits some of the, the cells that sense the light, but it goes through them and then bounces off the, the tapetum lucidum layer and goes through those cells again and can still interact with them, setting off more of a reaction. So it allows animals to see better in the dark by a factor of close to two. 
But because it's so reflective, we see that, 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 that eyes looking like they're shining when we shine a light on them. And in sharks, these are green. And in deep water sharks, they're really obvious. So they often have this green colored pupil where ours are black. And oh, so that's, that's the cool. so they can they can see uh, pretty well under underwater at night, which is when they mostly feed. Okay, exactly, great. and they have these big eyes that also makes yeah. it clear that there there's a reason for them being big, and they they need that. And why would you need to see well in the pitch black of the deep ocean? Well, it's because they uh, communicate with each other via bioluminescence, and they see other fish that also produce bioluminescence, which is this ability to glow in the dark um, by means of what Ron, Ron mentioned is those photophores that they have. These are cells that um, produce light. It's amazing little sharks. There's another species of, of cookie cutter shark. That's the common one there. There's also one called the large tooth cookie cutter shark, as if the teeth of this shark weren't already large what? enough, being the largest relative to its size of any shark. There's one species, Isistius plutotus, which uh, is the large tooth cookie cutter shark and has even bigger teeth uh, to, to make these cookie cutter uh, cuts with. Uh, the name Isistius, the, the genus name there, uh, comes from uh, the, the goddess Isis, which was the god of light. And it has to do with their ability to produce light from their bellies. Okay. So we're, we're gonna get started here. I'm going to uh, remove these for now. And we're going to take off the sample. And I'm going to start with uh, the, the guide shape. So if you have a, a colored uh, pencil, take it out. If not, then just draw lightly as I go along here. I'm going to switch to red. And I'm going to switch to, sorry, I'm just checking to see where my little tools are. There we go. Uh, and we are ready to go. So the first thing you'll want to do is, uh, where is the fold? Yeah, here we go. Hang on. There it is. Okay. So the first thing you want to do is take your page and lightly fold it in half in both directions. Just what we want is to make a little crease uh, in the in, in both ways. So just give it a little bit of a crease along the edge. So that way, when you open it back up again, you'll see those lines going through the center of the, of the page, both vertically and horizontally, up and down and sideways. All that's going to do is help us to, to know where to put different parts of this drawing. Uh, and the reason I'm asking that is because the first thing that we're gonna do is use those lines. So if you set up your sheet, sort of the widest, um, sort of in landscape format, so that it's, it's wider than it is tall, we're going to draw the, the first line starting near the center, but just a little bit above from it, starting from that, that crease that, that goes up and down. And just going to make kind of like a, a long hairpin shape going out to uh, about two thirds of the way or three quarters of the way out to the end, and then w turning back and then heading back toward the bottom half of that fold and then stop at the middle like this. We're going to be starting drawing the snout and the head of the shark this way. I'm just going to fix up a little. There we go. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, you can sketch. We do that all the time as artists. You'll see my lines are a little bit wonky sometimes too. I'm usually nor I'm used to doing this kind of uh, a little more sketchy uh, instead of making single lines. But you'll see that sometimes I have um, shown a little bit of a preview of the line lightly before I put it in, and that's help us to see where we want to put the line. The next thing we want to do is, is, is give the shark a, a back end, a posterior end, including the tail region. So uh, we're going to put another uh, line now connecting the front end of the shark to the back end. And this one is going to be kind of like two flattened S shapes. And so we're going to start again at the top of the shark. We're at that fold just where we started the last time. And we're gonna go backward this time to the left. And you're gonna go and make this, oh, this is a really bad line, but you know, like this down. And then you'll stop there and then go down a wee bit, make kind of a, a sharp point and then continue in a sort of flat S shape back toward the other end of the line you first made like that. 
it's kind of two sort of flattened S's. And I'm just going to fix up this little bit here because I, I really kind of went beyond where I wanted to go with that little bit there. So you can do that. So too, it sort of looks like one of those comments that you would put, you know, when you're animating yeah, a comment, right. like someone's talking. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, exactly. Like a, what are those, um, like a, a speech bubble sort of thing. Yeah, speech bubble. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right, right. It's sort of a flattened speech bubble. Um, there we go. Good, good. Yes, we like to compare the shapes we're doing to well-known shapes. Um, I do a lot of eggs and um, various kinds of things uh, when when we're making these guide shapes. Uh, the speech bubble is a good one to use here. Okay, there we go. So that's our, our shark speech bubble. <laughs> it's now a speech bubble shark. We're going to make it into a cookie cutter shark. The first thing we want to do to modify this shape is kind of give it a little bit more of a snout. Now, this, this varies a bit. So the photos you saw, those beautiful photos by Jeff Millison, showed that the snout of this shark was very much just rounded, just like we have already drawn. And so that's fine. But when it's, when it's opening its mouth, and this shark, the one we're drawing, is opening its mouth just starting to open its mouth to attach onto a prey species. In that case, the jaws can, the jaws of sharks are amazingly mobile. They can thrust them forward in some species, for example. And that changes the, when they open their mouth, it changes the shape, shape of their snout a little bit. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna give it a little bit of a notch underneath the snout. Um, so starting here, and I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here just so you can see it more clearly. Um, Starting here at the right side, at the tip of the snout, you're going to draw a line that's just a little bit further in than the one that we drew, like this, sort of a little away and then a little bit back toward it. That's all. Okay. And then this part here that we, whoops, that wasn't intended, <laughs> two little stray marks. There we go. This little part that we drew here first, you can actually just erase that bit out, that part that I've just marked. So I'm just going to erase that bit out because we just sort of modified the shape here just to make it more accurate for when it's opening its mouth. Uh, as you saw again in, in Jeff Millison's photos, when it's swimming, when it's not going to eat something or, or to, to take a bite, its jaws are closed. And so the photos that we have, most of the photos of the cookie cutter shark showing its, its teeth open are usually ones that have been um, on the shore or have been taken out of the water uh, and are probably not alive anymore in many cases that have been in nets and such. And so people have, are seeing this in, in sort of like a slack jaw, literally slack jawed sort of a state where it's no longer keeping its mouth closed. And sometimes they've pulled the lips back to show the teeth. Uh, but when it's alive, it's, its mouth is closed and it, it's pretty much just flush with the rest of the face. But we're showing it when its mouth would be open in the wild naturally, when it's just about to attack something. So here we go. Uh, the next thing we're going to add to the shark is one of the pectoral fins. Now, pectoral fins are those ones that are equivalent to our arms. They're the, the pair of fins that are just behind the gills, just behind the head. Uh, and this shark has little pectoral fins. And again, what you saw, and I was really happy to see those photos of, by Jeff Millison, because they show the way the shark actually holds its fins when, when swimming. Unlike many other species of sharks, and there are a few exceptions, like the tawny nurse shark, it holds its uh, pectoral fins up and like outward, but, but turned upward even, not, not straight out like, like the wings of a plane, but even turned a bit upward, which is really neat. And so we're going to draw our pectoral fin kind of like that, so kind of pointed upward a little bit. And to do that, you're going to go to near the, the center of these two creases that you made. Uh, and we're going to draw a line actually coming from just a little bit out from the center. And it's kind of a triangular shape. Kind of like this, up a little bit. And then the back end of that fin is flush with the crease that you made that goes up and down. And it goes back like this. And there's a little bit of a, this sort of a, like a forked two line here happening because there's a little bit of a, a little bit of, uh, of tissue or skin that connects it to the rest of the body that, that kind of um, looks like it's, it's, there's a thinner section there. Okay? So that's, that's the pectoral fin on the right side of the shark, uh, which is on our side of its body. And it's held outward and upward. 
a bit. Kind of like when, you know, pigeons glide. If you ever seen a pigeon glide with its wings sort of canted upward, similar sort of situation to that. Now, there's also another pectoral fin. Because it has two pectoral fins, but we only see most of one of them on our side. But the other one is also seen as a little bit of a triangular notch on the other side of the shark underneath its belly. You can just see it past the belly like that. So just a small bit. It's only a little bit visible because it's mostly on the other side. But we're also seeing the shark a little bit from below, right? So that we can show its jaws. So you can see the fin on the other side a little bit. There you go. Now, the other thing that we want is to give it additional fins. One of the most important fins on this shark, uh, other than the pectoral fins, uh, is the tail fin or the caudal fin, as it's called. This is what propels it. Uh, this is what uh, wiggles back and forth really rapidly. If you've ever seen this video of this species, it's very hard to find pictures of this in the wild uh, and even harder to find video. There's only one video I know of of this shark. If you Google cookie cutter shark video, uh, you'll probably be able to find it. And it's this rapidly swimming little uh, it looks like a little torpedo swimming with a quickly uh, a wiggling tail, uh, but it's amazing to see that. And so it has two lobes to its tail, like most sharks do. Um, and the upper lobe is what we're going to start with first. So near the end of the shark, near the tail, we're going to draw this, I don't know even what you would call this. It's kind of like a triangle, I guess. It goes up and then it comes back down like this and then meets at the very tip of that body. Okay, so oops, that was a little line that you don't need that extra line that and my computer just made a mistake there. So I'll just erase out that bit that last thick line wasn't necessary. But anyway, so that is what the upper lobe looks like. It's the bigger lobe as it is with most sharks. But the lower lobe of the cookie cutter shark is not that much smaller than the upper lobe. So we're going to put the lower lobe in as well. The lower lobe starts about at the level where we started the upper lobe, but from the bottom of the body. And it comes out like this, and it's about this far. And it's also kind of a, a triangle with a little bit of a hook in it like that. It joins the upper lobe right there at the end of the body. So you can see that they're actually pretty close to the same size. Sort of makes sense when you think about it. These sharks, um, as I mentioned, I keep mentioning they're similar to, they look like torpedoes. Um, and they have two lobes that are similar size and you see that in other sharks that swim quickly like the mackerel sharks like the white shark and mako sharks and relative to its size the cookie cutter shark actually has to swim very quickly because it has to pursue prey that are much bigger than itself tuna are some of the fastest swimming fish in the ocean whales travel very fast compared to the size of this uh, shark and almost any other animal that's large enough for it to make a meal out of swims pretty quickly relative to its size. So it has to be able to propel itself very quickly. And so when you see that video and you see its tail just beating really quickly, you can understand that it needs to swim fast and that having this kind of an equal size tail, which is typical of fast swimming fish, makes sense. Okay, so that's the tail or the caudal fin. Now it's also got another pair of fins called the pelvic fins. Uh, and it's similar to like the, the term pelvis around our hips, for example, that's the equivalent um, fins to what would be the same as our legs. Okay? In, in, in our evolutionary ancestors, uh, in the fish that went out onto land first, it is those fins that evolved into legs uh, for on land animals. So we're going to draw the left pelvic fin first, and it's going to start out about here at the bottom of the, the shark's body. And it's going to be just basically a triangle with a little bit of a rounded end like that. Joins up with the body. So that's near the, the, the back end of the shark. There's also a right pelvic fin, which is on our side of the body. The one we drew was on the far side, but it's on the bottom of the shark's body. So you can see the whole thing. On our side, there's another one. And that comes out like this. And then turns back. And then pretty much meets the other pelvic fin at the bottom of the body. You see that they start apart at the front end and then where they meet the body at the back they pretty much join together almost and that's pretty typical of a lot of sharks um the the front end is a little bit further apart than the back end of the fins of the pelvic fins okay and so now we also need dorsal fins now the cookie cutter shark relative to most sharks have very small dorsal fins dorsal fins are the ones on the back of the animal there is one species of shark 
called the sandbar shark, which has an enormous dorsal fin compared to other sharks, uh, compared to the dorsal fin size of other sharks compared to its body. Uh, also, the great hammerhead has the most spectacularly long dorsal fin. Other uh, species that are related to sharks, like this, um, this, the shark ray, for example, which is a ray, it also has a beautifully big dorsal fin and, and sawfish as well. Okay? But cookie cutter sharks don't have big dorsal fins. They have little ones. In fact, the second dorsal fin, because there's two of them, is bigger than the first. And we can barely see it also because we're seeing the shark a little bit from below, but we're going to put them in anyway. So starting about halfway out from the center of those creases and just below that horizontal crease, you're going to make this little notch, little triangular shaped notch coming and with a rounded end coming out of the back of the shark like that. That's the first dorsal fin. Now you can't see all of it because the base is around the curve of the shark's body, but you can see the tip of it. The second dorsal fin starts at about the same level along the body as the pelvic fins, but on top of the shark. So that comes out and has a little bit of a sharper tip than the first one, not too sharp though. Um, and is a little bit longer than the first dorsal fin. So you can see it's a little bit longer than that, that top one, the first one. That's the case in many of these uh, little deep water dogfish. Dogfish are a group of sharks. Uh, in the uh, what we call an order, it's like above family. There's there's a whole species, then there's a genus, which is a group of species uh, that has been described by a group of scientists called taxonomists, who who determine how organisms can be classified. And then there's a family level above that, and then order. And the order Squaliforms uh, contains the dogfish sharks, and cookie cutter sharks are a group of dogfish. Uh, so that's commonly found among them. Now we get to the interesting part of the shark, the, the mouth. Okay, so this is what this shark is all about. We're going to give it um, first the overall outline of the mouth. And that is kind of like a, you know, like a flattened jelly bean almost in shape, starting at the point where we uh, modify. So I'll draw an arrow here. You don't have to draw the arrow, but that's where it starts. We're going to make a little bit of a almost like a flattened bean like this, the weird wonky shape. Imagine, if you will, a shark with its mouth open. That's kind of what it looks like, but there's a reason why it's drawn, why we're drawing it open like this and why it's so wide and rounded in the, in the ends. It's because these sharks have lips, very well-developed lips. You don't think of sharks having lips, but cookie cutter sharks, have the best developed lips probably of any shark. Uh, in fact, the mouth is actually a lot longer than that. The jaws could, if it didn't have these special lips, the mouth would open much wider. And we'll draw in kind of a long hook shape to show where the end, the corners of the mouth actually go to. And so you start at the near the, the corner of what you draw as the mouth. You go up and back from there into this long uh, sort of line back there and then sharply turn back toward the mouth again and end like that. So this is actually, no, this part is all closed. So imagine if you were to imagine your, your cheeks on the side, if you put your fingers um, and press against your cheeks, you can feel your teeth, right? Through your, through your cheek. And you can feel that, that your mouth opens up further back behind the corner of your, of your lips. Well, that's kind of what's happening here. We're seeing a little bit of a gap um, or a little bit of a, a like a groove almost, uh, showing how far back the mouth actually could open if it didn't have lips. But that's all sort of just tissue. That's like the, like cheek tissue. It's a shark with cheeks, basically. <laughs> uh, now we're going to show another part of the, the lips sort of a, a, in these guide shapes. The corners of the mouth, the actual open part, have these thickened um, lip components. Th these sharks have better lips than any Hollywood actor. Um, they, they have the most amazingly developed lips of any uh, water animal probably, or very nearly so, and much better than we have ours. They have several different components to their lips. It's because they use these as a suction cup. Okay, So we're going to draw in these, these little lines here at the corner of the mouth, basically just a little extra line, almost like 
it almost looks like another similar shape as the mouth, but but smaller. And then on the other side of the shark's uh, mouth as well, again, kind of like a flattened bean. Those are two sort of little bits of tissue in the corners that help to seal the shark's mouth against whatever animal it's taking a bite out. And so what's really neat about these is that I mentioned you, they've got several components of their lips. Their lips are so well developed because when they come and swim up to a large fish or a whale or another large shark, they'll ram into it with their mouth open and then they'll, they'll basically stick their mouth on it and generate suction. Uh, so they'll sort of pull back, but the lips seal them against the surface of the skin really tightly. That's very important because then the teeth can, can grab on and not push the shark away, grab on, but then the shark uses that powerful little tail to swing itself into a, uh, into a spiral motion. And that spiral motion with the lips still attached, sealed to the animal, will allow those, those teeth to be able to gouge out just a piece of, uh, of, of the flesh of the animal. Relative to the size of the animal, it's a small bit. And the animals, they live on just fine. It's probably a little bit painful, but they live on just fine. And, um, but the shark gets a meal out of it. And because it's such a small shark, that's a large amount of a meal compared to its body. Anyway, so that's what the lips are for. It's to seal it against its prey. Now we're going to put in the a guideline to show where the lower set of teeth, the, the, the business end of the shark, and, and really the business end of the jaws in this case. There's just a line basically halfway through the mouth from one corner to the other. That this Again, you want to put this in lightly because this is not an actual line that the shark has. It's just helps us to guide where we're going to end the teeth. The shark also needs an eye. As we mentioned, these see very well in the dark. It seems counterintuitive, seems weird to think that a shark living in the absolute blackness of the deep would need big eyes. But as we mentioned, there are a lot of animals down there that produce their own light in the black. So this has a big egg-shaped eye starting about here, just above where the corner of the mouth is. And we're going to make this sort of oval shape, flat oval shape like that. That's the outline of the eye big for its the size of its head um, it can it can take in a lot of light a lot of um, the there's a large area of, of, of surface sorry a large surface area of the eye of the um, the retina which is the sensitive part of the back of the eye that registers light and again because it has that tapetum lucidum layer behind the retina it can get basically twice as much information from the light coming to it it's really neat animals we also need uh, nostrils. So these sharks uh, have a, a good sense of smell, like a lot of sharks do. We're going to draw a line that shows sort of the outside edge of those nostrils. Again, it's a light line. This is not the shape of the nostril, but basically the outer edge of where the nostrils will we're put in in detail. So basically, imagine it's kind of like a torpedo, and there's like a round little cap to the torpedo, as often torpedoes have, like the sensor area. And really, the nostrils are sensors. They're really good at picking up chemical cues from the water. Um, so, for example, if there's a fish that, that is bleeding or has other um, any kind of fluids that the fish uh, leaks into the environment or whatever, indication that there is life around and active uh, that might be a meal for it, it'll pick this up. And now this shark also has something that you find in other sharks. Just behind the eye, there's this hole, this paired holes in the head called spiracles. And they are an auxiliary breathing apparatus. So it has gills, but it also has spiracles for, for water intake. And in sharks, these spiracles are neat. They are a way for the shark's brain to get more oxygen. So basically, they're a means of, of getting more oxygen from the water to the shark's brain. So these guys are, are super powered, basically, in, in, in um, empowering their brains as well. So you're going to make this little, almost like a comma shape behind the the eye like this and then there's a little line that joins down like that so that's basically the close to the shape and size of the spiracle it can be opened and closed um and uh, so that's kind of that line there you see and uh, again it, it allows water to enter and provide more oxygen toward the shark's brain and the gills now we're just going to draw an outline where the gills are going to be we're not going to draw right now all five gills but it has five gill slits on each side of its head 
And you're going to make this sort of flattened rectangle just in front of those pectoral fins of the one on our side, like this. Again, a light line because we're not going to keep all of these lines after. But there you go. So those are the guide shapes for the shark. Doesn't look too much like a finished uh, cookie cutter shark yet, but you can see the overall shape we're after. What we're going to do now is I'd like you to, if you're using a different color, to switch to the darker one. Or if you've been using the same pencil or pen, just make sure you use heavier lines for this. And then, you know, if we need to, we can, we can erase out some of the guide shapes as we need. We're going to start putting in the final details on it so that we have a completed shark. Uh, and now, so the first thing we're going to do is, as we just mentioned, we have gill slits, right? So this shark has five gill slits on each side. I've shifted to my black color. And um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit here just to show you a little bit better. So that rectangle we made was just a guide for where the gill slits are going to be. We're going to make the front and end gill slits first. The first one, it's a little bit curved like this, see, like that. Then the back end one. I usually like to suggest drawing the front and end gills first because it makes it easier to space them out properly that way. Then you can put in the middle one right in between them. And then between each of those two, there's also another one. So that makes five in total. Most sharks have five gill slits, right? This is where the water exits, it enters the mouth, goes over the gill filaments, which are very rich in blood and very thin skin so that it can draw uh, oxygen out of the water and expel carbon dioxide from the blood. And then that deoxygenated water, water that has its oxygen removed from it somewhat, passes out through the gill slits. Um, so they're kind of little uh, exit slits. It's five of them. Other sharks sometimes have other numbers. Most have five. There are a group of sharks called the cow sharks, uh, which include the six gill sharks, seven gill sharks, and the frilled shark. And their name suggests it. The frilled shark and the six gill sharks have six gill slits on each side, and the seven gill sharks have seven. Uh, there's also a six gill saw shark, which is a really interesting one. We did this one, actually. We, we drew this uh, I think we drew a six gill saw shark at one point. Oh, no, no, that was a coloring sheet. We did Anna's saw shark. But anyway, so this one has five gill slits. There we go. That's the gill slits. Uh, now we're going to put in more detail uh, on the shark's eye. So as I mentioned, these sharks can see very well underwater. So again, I'm zoomed in here. We're going to draw again over the line that we drew for the eye. It's going to be that same oval shape. We're just tracing over the same line we drew before, as nice oval as we can make it. I'm a little wonky, but you know that's okay. And then on the front end and the back end, there's a wee bit of a notch. Like this, just make that black. Because these sharks have a little bit of a kind of a groove in the side of their head where their eye sits, and their eyes actually bulge out. They're huge. And because they need to be able to see well, they have a huge pupil. So the pupil is the black part of your eye, right? Where light actually enters all the way to your retina. And so the pupil on these sharks is circular. In this case, it's a little bit um, of a, uh, like a slanted, over, a slanted uh, circle here because we're seeing it a little bit from below, right? Kind of like when you take a circle and you slant it, you can see that it changes shape a little bit. And then there's also a, a little bit of a, a difference in color so you can make another circle around that one. It's a bit of a, a brighter uh, green region around. Ooh, wow, my lines are a little bit wonky. That's okay. Here we go. Okay, so it's kind of like, again, if you look at that, that uh, sample that I had, the colored sample of the shark, which is right here, you can see what's happening. There's that bright green reflected uh, light coming out of the, the, the pupil. That's where that's light coming from the tapetum lucidum, the green colored reflective layer. But then around it, the iris of the shark, uh, the sort of the, the muscular area is also green colored. So um, you have a bit of that happening. Okay, so that is the eye. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit again. And now we're going to put again the detail of the spiracle. Remember that. That little bit behind the eye, that opening that, um, that allows water to enter to oxygenate the brain better. So again, there's that sort of comma shape. And then the line that allows it to be, there's, it's, it's kind of a slit. It can open and close um, to change the amount of water being able to enter. 
I would imagine um, that when it's swimming really actively, that's open because it needs to be able to um, provide better oxygen to its brain when it's really active. And, and when other parts of its body are also drawing um, air, drawing uh, really oxygen rich blood and reduces the amount maybe that the brain can get. So now we have the nostrils, right? So we drew that funny little circle around the, uh, the front end of the snout. We're going to put in the shape of the nostrils now. And for that, the, you're going to follow the outer edge of that line on top on the left side. Sorry, on the, uh, on the shark's right side. We're going to go to the center crease that you made and then turn back. And it's a, a funny shape. It's like a, almost like a figure eight. But what we're seeing here, and you can fill it in with black as well, actually, because that's, that's a, the open area of the nostril. That's where water enters. They don't breathe through the nostrils like we do, right? The nostrils are only used for sensing uh, chemicals in the water, like we sense smells. So what you have is that black area is the actual opening. That part, I'm just going to draw a line. You don't have to draw this arrow, but I'm going to draw an arrow. That, that little center part that looks like it, it closes off the what would be an otherwise an oval is kind of a flap. Uh, it's a nasal flap. And so it's a little bit of tissue that extends... Uh, back and these help to change the the way that water flows as they enter no the nostrils, and so changing the water flow direction can help direct it and allow probably the shark to smell better. So that's the one nostril. The other nostrils on the other side of the head, but because we're seeing the shark from a little bit from below and a little bit from the front, you can see that other nostril. And also, because these sharks have really huge nostrils, um, as uh, as, as compared to sharks. So uh, I think we see somebody's in the waiting room there. And so there's the other nostril. And we're going to just finish that on the other side of the shark like this. There we go. That's the other nostril. <clears throat> Again, that's going to be colored in with black. Like that. And there are our sharks, two great big nostrils. Okay. Now we're going to finish off the right pectoral fin, which is the one on our side. So again, pretty much we already traced that out. The reason I'm doing the fins first instead of the body is because we don't want those lines that drew that went through the fins to be finished up. We're going to draw around those fins okay, with the final lines. And then the right pelvic fin, which was the one near the back of the shark. This one here, again, just trace over the line you did. But when you get to the end, so there's the back corner. Just go a little bit further back like this in toward, toward the front, actually, sorry, of the shark. And there's an extra little line here, a very light one, that basically just a kind of a crease where the actual fin attaches to the body. Okay, so now what we're going to do is the outline of the body overall. So you can just basically trace around the outside of the shark that you already did. This is pretty straightforward. Start, I'm going to start at the tail here. Trace around the edge of the tail. Again, this really neat tail that has two lobes. Uh, it's called, the shape is uh, in sharks, this is a heterocircle tail. Hetero meaning different. Um, it means that the, the lobes are of two different sizes and the upper lobe is larger than the lower lobe. Um, and there's our, our second dorsal fin and our first dorsal fin. And actually you can draw the line as well underneath them that connects the body along, but not through the pelvic fin. Okay? And we'll continue forward along the body edge of the shark toward the pectoral fin. We're going to stop at the pectoral fin, not draw through it. And then we'll con continue on the other side toward the front end of the body of the shark. And tracing the same line we did above the head to the snout, curve around the nose and the nostrils, and then slight dip into that initial shape, and then back down here toward the second, oops, sorry, far side um, pectoral fin, the shark's um, left pectoral fin. Yeah. And we're going to draw the body through that, back toward the, the right pelvic, sorry, the left pelvic fin, the left and right are back right here. Uh, and then draw around the outside of that pelvic fin. Oops, there's a little bit of a. Yep, looks like I just missed that line a little bit. I'm just going to fix it. That's okay. 
And uh, that allows us to continue this pelvic fin back toward the back end of the pelvic fin. And again, when we get there, we're going to make this little notch heading forward to basically join with the other one. And they pretty much join at the back, as I mentioned. And there's a, a very light crease that you can draw here as well, where it joins the body, the actual fleshy part. And continue behind that pelvic fin toward the tail. And we're going to draw the lower lobe of the tail like we did before. And then hook back toward the back of the bottom where we began. The last thing that we have here that we didn't draw in is the that pectoral the pectoral fin, the front pair of fins the, on the far side, the one there, just a little notch like that. Okay, that's the shark's body outline. You can also draw a light line here of that part of the body that continues through the tail fin, right? So that's actually where the spine would continue. It's a very light line because it's really just kind of an area where the body gets thicker like that. And other sharks have that, that part of the, the body containing the spine go through the, through the tail fin or caudal fin as well in different shapes. Now um, we have also um, the tail spine. No. Okay. There we go. Um, what did I draw there? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I have my notes. I'm not sure what the note was. Okay, there we go. Good. Uh, so we have a the we've got the pectoral fins in place. We have the dorsal fins in place. Now we need to put the uh, the lips on the shark. So this is we're going to go back toward the front end of the shark, and we're going to talk about the, the fun part of the shark here, the mouth. So we have the the mouth. Um, that we drew as guide shapes. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make those separate little lip sections on the side, right? These little bits that we traced out first. Hey, Julius, I yes. since we're back at the lips and the teeth and the mouth, uh, had a question. Uh, Sophie mm -hmm. asked, Yes. Is, is it known how long it takes for that shark to take that bite? Is it mm -hmm. super fast or take a long That's time? Or how? Really good question, actually. Um, when you think about it, I, I don't. No, I don't think anybody's actually seen it feed, which would be an amazing video. Yeah. Uh, that would be really amazing. But because they typically feed in the depths and because, as you mentioned, they're ambush predators, they sneak up on their prey. It's not easy to go out and watch them feed. It's also dark around. So even just finding them would be difficult. Um, what we can tell is that how large a, a piece of flesh they remove um, because you can see that in their guts and some uh, some cookie cutter sharks that were caught, you could see the, the, the plug of flesh inside. It's quite large and it's long. Uh, and in the large tooth cookie cutter shark, it's even bigger. They can take an even bigger chunk out. But the, the reasonable thing to think of is that it would have to happen pretty quickly, partly because if the prey noticed them being bitten into, they would they would try to get away, right? So the cookie cutter shark has to be fast. So even though it has these nice suctioning lips, there's a, probably a limit to what it can take in terms of, of, of the, the speed of water pushing past it if the animal speeds up suddenly. So I would think it would have to happen pretty quickly. And based on the fact that you can see them move their tail very quickly, they're already adapted to move rather quickly. So they would probably be able to make that, that spin real fast. They also have very razor sharp teeth, so it'd be really easy to do that for any animal that has pretty soft flesh. And a lot of fish have pretty soft flesh. It would probably really sort of be like, you know, when a mosquito comes, you don't see it coming. It bites you by the, or sting, by the time you realize it and you look down to swat it, it's flying away. It's yeah. probably yeah. that quick. And it's such yeah. a surgical yeah. uh, piece removed. It's, it's, it's probably very quick. And as you mentioned, the fish or the whale or, or whatever doesn't even realize it until it's over. And yeah. then it heals back eventually. Exactly. It heals back. And you can see that when you go out in the wild, if you've ever seen whales in a tropical region. So this is the other thing. Cookie cutter sharks only live in tropical regions and subtropical, a band around the earth. So um, you'll see that animals that, that frequent the tropical regions that live there or migrate there will have these oval shaped light colored uh, patches on their bodies sometimes, sometimes several of them, sometimes a whole bunch of them. And those are typically cookie cutter shark scars. 
Yeah, uh, little cir circular thing. Uh, on humpback whales, for instance, uh, that I've, I've seen them on the humpback whales. So that's interesting. There you go. So that's it. And they're, they're usually on the sides and sort of the back end of the animal, not so near the head usually, because of course they are ambush predators. They come up from behind, but you'll see lots of these scars on them. So they heal over. It's just, you know, they still probably try to get away if they feel it. Maybe the large ones don't even feel it. I don't know, but they're probably very fast in how they do this. Yeah. That's a good question though. And, uh, and then of course there's that, the, those, those lips that help the suction create the suction to stick them to the animal. So that's the corner of the, the, the lips. They also have uh, a, a section of lips in the front. Okay, so starting from that one on, on our side, you're going to make this little line away, a little bit away from the, the, the mouth line you did and then connect to the mouth and then trace that line back to the corner of the lip there. And then on the other side of the shark's mouth, the same sort of thing, but a little bit shorter because we're seeing it, what's called foreshortened. It's, it's around, the, around the, the body of the shark and we're seeing it a little bit more um, edge on. So we're, it looks a little bit shortened just from the way we're seeing it from the angle. Uh, there is also a section of lip, another whole section of it that is in the middle on the front to, con to connect and complete this suctioning area on the front like that. And then again, that edge of the mouth we drew before. So there's like three lip regions, actually maybe like four there, but part of it is underneath. Uh, and then the ones on the side, and then we'll complete the bottom of the mouth by again, tracing over the line we drew connecting those two suction bits. So there's that really nicely developed suctioning lips of the shark. And then again, you can just complete you know, that, that bit of jaw line that goes way back to sh show how far back its, its jaws could open. And when the shark opens its mouth, you can actually see this little groove. But when it's not opening its mouth, it's barely visible. There's a little bit of a line in the center like that. So we're say, showing it the mouth opening so we, we can see that now. Uh, and also, if the shark is opening its mouth, the lips can maybe sort of peel back a bit. So sometimes you see a little bit of, of evidence of how thick they are, these little extra little lines around it like this. It basically just shows how fleshy they are. They're really thick lips. Really good for suctioning. You can stretch a lot that way. Okay, so uh, now we're going to draw the, the teeth. This, I, I love the teeth of this shark. This is the craziest, neatest thing. And again, largest teeth relative to its body size for any living shark. Actually, yeah, probably any shark, period. Uh, might be some exceptions. i um, thinking the helicoprion, I'm not sure, but from the fossil record. But anyway, for this one, how to imagine these teeth? I'm going to draw on the side here. You don't have to draw this, but if you were to think of a picket fence, a, like a, those typical little white picket fences um, that you see, uh, sort of little they, they have a bunch of these wood panels that are right next to each other, like that. That's exactly the way that a cookie shark, cutter or shark's teeth are. That's maybe a little longer than they are. They're probably more like, and like this. But there's a row of them that join side to side with no gap between them, which is kind of unusual for a shark uh, for for the teeth um, joining for so much of their length with no gap between them. There are many other sharks like sand tiger sharks, for example, that have long teeth, but they're quite separate from each other. But the cookie cutter's shark's teeth form a single cutting unit. And that's crucial for it to be able to complete this, this scooping of flesh. So what we're going to do is use that line that we drew uh, through the center of the mouth as the the line where the tips of these teeth end. So we're going to put in about eight or so of these teeth. Imagine sort of a zigzag line like this. Roughly eight of them are visible as its mouth is opening. But they have up to about 20, about 25 or so teeth in the lower jaw. And then you can draw those lines uh, that, that show the, the sides of the teeth stuck together, basically. One tooth right against the other. And as you know, or as you may know, sharks have replaceable teeth. They can lose teeth and then they grow new ones continually. Same thing with a cookie cutter shark. But unlike other sharks that lose one tooth at a time usually, or several teeth maybe, and they'll fall out and new ones will come in to replace them, 
Cookie cutter sharks lose the entire row in a single chunk. So what happens? Um, it, it basically, the whole thing doesn't fall out. It swallows it. It swallows its own teeth when it needs to replace them. When they get old, maybe worn or something, and they get needs sharper ones to make a more effective cut, the whole lower row of teeth dislodges from its jaw and passes into its gut. And it's, it swallows these sharp teeth. So imagine how strong its, its guts must be to be able to take that. Inside of its, its uh, belly, those teeth separate from each other. Um, and so they don't stay in one large chunk. And why on earth would it do this and not just drop it? Well, it turns out that the teeth are a really good source of calcium. The shark digests the calcium from its own teeth to supplement its needs for calcium. And so cookie cutter sharks eat their own teeth, eat their entire row of teeth in one, one swallow, basically. Really weird. Uh, oh, bit. That's very efficient, you know? <laughs> right? And that makes sense because in the deep ocean, the deep ocean is often very limited in nutrients. It's a, in many parts, it's, it's kind of like a desert. And because a lot of the deep sea fish and such, um, sorry, I should say, because this shark takes only chunks of flesh out of its uh, uh, out of its prey and doesn't eat the whole thing it's not getting bones and such that would normally provide calcium for many other sharks when they digest their meals right so it needs another way to get this calcium it's the only shark that eats only a, a tiny portion of its prey by rule uh, and so this is the source of calcium that it gets it's really really efficient as you say it's really neat we also have a set of teeth on the upper part of the jaw. These are not nearly as big, but they're still going to be important probably for grabbing on to the animal as it starts to make its, um, its cookie cut. So these would probably um, serve to, to poke in and help it to pivot. Okay? So we're going to make these little teeth along the inside of the upper jaw. But also note that the upper jaw is actually smaller in diameter than the lower jaw. So the lower jaw has this big round a um, uh, bunch of teeth together. And the upper jaw is a smaller curve. So we're going to draw these little teeth like this. They're really small. They're pointier. They're not connected to each other side to side like the lower ones are. And they make a curve that's actually um, smaller than the lower jaw. So we're only going to see some of them here. Okay, the little ones. So you can see them on the inside of the jaw that's open. <clears throat> okay. And uh, there's other things we can add, uh, small details. Uh, so is, as the shark is turning, as it swims and, and bends its body, uh, you can see some of the lines, uh, little, little minor lines or grooves. We can use this also to sort of just to show that it's the shape of its body. So the contour is around. And the other thing is that you'll see in a lot of sharks, these sort of lines uh, down the side that that show you where the the ranks of muscles are. These are these are rows of muscles that help it to propel it and move its body side to side. In some sharks, you can actually see those bands of, of grooves. Uh, and uh, in some sharks, you can also see a little bit of, of like a little tiny groove-like thing along the, the belly. Uh, and then you can even maybe make out a little bit of where the jawline would be as it's opening its mouth like that. So that's basically the any extra little contours on the body. And the last thing we're going to do here is put in where the colors would be. Remember I mentioned at the beginning that it had that, that funny little color of dark. So I'm going to make a line here. You can color this in after if you like. But there's this line here. Actually, sorry. I'm just going to... I'm going to... Yeah, that's right. There's this line here that goes around the shark's head. This is a color difference, okay? And then just behind the gill slits, just in front of that, those pectoral fins. That dark band is there probably for a good reason. And, and we didn't talk about the photophores, but here's, here's the, one of the coolest things about the shark's lifestyle. Okay? So it, it feeds on large animals, but it also has to escape big fish, because it's a little shark, as long as you're forearm, it has to escape big fish from the deep ocean. 
because it moves up and down in the water column, it gets to a depth where there's a tiny amount of sunlight still filtering through the water. That tiny amount of sunlight, however, is enough for deep ocean fish, in some cases, to see the outline, the silhouette, the dark shadow of a fish above them. Uh, shadow is sort of basically blocking out the sunlight, a teeny bit of sunlight, a feeble glow. And that's why a lot of deep ocean fish have upward pointing eyes because they're hunting from below. And then when they see a shadow above them that's uh, of a small fish, they'll rise up and grab it. The cookie cutter shark has a secret weapon to make itself disappear. On the underside of its body, it's filled with special cells called photophores. These photophores have a, an ability to combine an enzyme and a, a substrate, two chemicals in its body called luciferin and luciferase. And when those combine in the presence of oxygen, they glow, they emit this bright green glow. So the entire belly of the shark glows green. And when you look at that from below, it matches the amount of light coming in from above the shark. So it cancels out its own shadow against the, the light, little bit of sunlight. So it makes itself invisible to fish from below. So it escapes predation. It escapes being hunted. But that line of photophores, those bright glowing cells producing this bioluminescence, there's a gap in them at this dark collar. Those don't, that doesn't glow. Why would this be? So the idea is, and this hasn't been observed, but the hypothesis is that this is a lure. It basically shows fish from above, or from, from below, hunting from below, that there is a fish above them. But it suggests that this fish is probably further up. So these fish are going toward, probably aiming a little bit above the cookie cutter shark because they think it's further away because it's a little band. The shark takes advantage of this and comes in, and as they're approaching, it can detect them using its nostrils and its good vision and takes a bite out of them. So the would-be predator becomes oh, wow. the prey. The shark uses its, uh, its own photophores and the gap in the photophores to lure in the predator, which it then takes a bite out of. It's an amazing so it's both, uh, it's both a defense mechanism and an offense to exactly. capture prey. Very interesting. Yeah. I didn't know it's, that. Huh. It's such a spectacular species. So that's that's, a, that's the, 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 the hypothesis behind the, the collar. It also has a, a white edges to its fins. These wouldn't really be visible in the dark, but a lot of sharks have these. So if you look at the, the pectoral fins, there's a little white band on the edges on the, the back end. And also this happens for the dorsal fins. So there's a little white band along the back. You can color this in afterwards if you like. And the pelvic fins, there's a little narrow white band along the back end of them like this. And then also the caudal fin, the tail fin. Oh, and actually, I'm just going to say, this is uh, my little dogfish here. This is Tycho. He has made an appearance. And we're talking about dogfish. He's a little, he's my little helper. And then Wiki is our other little helper who has just jumped on over there. <laughs> so a little bit of, we have little dogfish here. And then the last bit, as I mentioned, is this little white sort of trailing edge of the caudal fin or the tail fin. Like this. Those, if you wanted to color in, those edges would be white in color. I'm not sure why those are white in this species. There probably is a good reason for them all being white. Not all sharks have that, but a lot of them do. Uh, maybe it is an additional lure. I don't know. But anyway, that's our shark. Uh, now I'm going to take out our guide shapes that we drew. And when you do that, and I'm actually also going to take out those creases because um, you know we don't need that. You can uh, smooth it out, the folds. And there we go. Um, that is our cookie cutter shark, uh, wow. complete with its so shape cool. and the, the teeth and the, the color patterns and everything. And, and now you've drawn your cookie cutter shark. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Ron. And thank you so much for joining us. For those who are here, um, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, and for those who will see this after from the recording, I hope you had fun drawing this shark. Uh, and seeing the wonderful photos and uh, great examples of Halloween related material that uh, Ron showed at the beginning as well. And of course, here he is with his, uh, I love his outfits. They're the best uh, costumes uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Shark Ambassador uh, land. You want to stop sharing just a little I'll bit? Do. I'll do. Uh, yeah. Sign us off. Here we go. 
Okay, it's all yours. All right. Well, that was pretty cool. That was that was actually, I think, one of the tougher ones to draw. It's such a simple shark, but very complex. A lot going on. And out of all of the shark drawing I've done with you, Julie, I probably learned the most about this cookie cutter, which it's a very uh, elusive shark that not a lot of people know a lot about. And I'm sure Jeff will even want to watch this because I'm sure you mentioned some things that maybe he doesn't know. So very, very informative and very creative. I'll, I'll, I've got to do some shading, but. Uh, oh, look at that. Oh, excellent. Oh, even at the green oh, eye in there. That looks great. If, That's really super. If you can teach me how to draw, then you can teach <laughs> anyone how to draw. Because wow, I'm, you did a great job. That's awesome. Thanks. And it'd be really neat to see. Um, uh, do you guys have a means of, uh, of, of people sending in their drawings? We, we do. They can, they can send them um, either on Facebook or through our website, sharksforkids.com. There's a info at sharksforkids.com uh, email that we would be happy to post those. I'll definitely post mine. Um, and uh, if, if Sophie, if you want to send yours and any of the other people, yeah, that'd be great. Send theirs, we'll, we'll get those posted. I think that would be a lot of fun and we'll, we'll put all the appropriate tags, but uh Oh, and thank you, Sophie, for the great questions. There was, yeah. Those are some really fun things to think about. Yes. Excellent, excellent questions. Um, so Sophie says hers is better than her mom's either. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so definitely better than my attempt at a uh, cookie cutter shark. But uh, it would be fun if I went to a marine biology party. I'm sure a few people might guess. Yeah, I think so, too. Exactly. Kids party. Yeah. So um, again, thanks a lot, Julius, for uh, for uh, doing this once again. I know everyone loves these, both the people that attend as well as uh, the people that watch them. We get lots of hits uh, once they're uploaded. So I'll be uploading this shortly, probably within a day or so, and uh, people can watch it before Halloween. So with that, I'm going to uh, sign off and I'll give you the, uh, the last word if you want to uh, cool. say anything to the kids. Again, thank you so much. Um, thank you for joining. Thank you, Sophie, and, and your mom, and uh, for everybody that joined us, and for everybody who is watching this afterwards. Uh, something to think about. Um, you know, we didn't talk a lot about the conservation of this shark, and I, and I, I kind of, in hindsight, would have loved to have spoken more about it, and I should have. But this shark is not currently really threatened, but many sharks are, many sharks and many rays, including sawfish especially. So anything we can do to help them is great because we share this planet with so many millions of species. And, you know, there are very few of many of these species, sometimes only a very small handful. So whatever we can do to help them, for example, anything to protect the oceans. Uh, one good thing to do is to avoid using plastics as much as possible, because even if, you know, plastics are gathered up afterwards, some of it makes it to the ocean, it breaks down to microplastics that ends up going into food webs. And, a lot of species, the predators especially, will accumulate these in their bodies because they eat prey with them as well. And that has been shown to be harmful. So anything we can do to reduce that. Uh, also, anything we can do to avoid eating species that are in danger. So there are some sustainable shark fisheries, but other ones are not. So be very careful in the sources. Look for labels uh, from organizations that do a good job of monitoring how sustainably fish are taken. Like for example, there's um, Seafood Watch from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. There's uh, Ocean Wise from uh, initially the Vancouver Aquarium and several others as well that help us and that they, they put stickers on in grocery stores to show that this product, this particular source of fish is a safer one to go with than, than other ones that are maybe not marked. Um, and you know, this way we, we, we do what we can also to try to avoid uh, this practice of shark finning, where if shark fins are removed, sometimes the sharks are thrown back in the water alive um, because they're a delicacy. So if we can avoid that happening as well, that's good. I, I personally, I'm very careful with things like, uh, for example, um, uh, sushi is, is something where you can sometimes get a lot of misidentification of some of the species that are involved. So be careful with where you eat specifically. Ask them to see if they can tell you that they know where this came from, because that can be really useful as well to know, to avoid putting more pressure on these uh, beautiful animals uh, that just want to live in their environment than we have. So with that, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it was uh, fun for me and I hope you enjoyed yourself as well. Thank you again, Ron and Sharks for Kids for 
for hosting uh, me and for having me on these. I have a lot of fun with them and I look forward to the next time we can, we can interact. Oh, thank, and, you. thank you so much. We really appreciate it and have a, a happy Halloween. Everybody. Yes. Have a happy Halloween and All safe. Bye-bye. Right.